Okay, so great. So thank you to the organizers. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, right, so I was asked to talk about some of our endo work, and there's a couple of topics that I like to discuss, dual working electrode and impedance spectroscopy. And uh, although after seeing the talks yesterday, I want to sort of um, calibrate you on what I mean. Okay, high current densities. I'm not going to be talking about 500 milliamps per centimeter squared. I'm talking about, you know, when we do these operando studies on, on such materials that we get sort of similar current densities to what we expect in an actual device. So like we're, we're working at one sun illumination, and so depending on the band gap, something between 10 and 20 milliamps per centimeter squared. So that's the sort of current range we're working in. We want to be able to see what's going on under similar sort of current ranges. So uh, maybe just as a little bit of background, so there are a little bit of, um, there are a few advantages to this approach. If you have this integrated system, so we're basically combining a solar cell and an electrolyzer into one material. And so you can have one device and you, have, you can save on balance of costs there. Uh, you're operating at pretty low, relatively low current density, so the catalyst doesn't work as hard. You just need 20 milliamps per centimeter squared. Also, you can take advantage of thermal approaches uh, or thermal, um, thermal what's it, balancing. So basically, you're sticking this solar cell material into water or some thin film of water. So you can effectively cool your photoabsorber, which is going to keep your photovoltage higher. It's going to allow you to, have, to maintain higher efficiency under irradiation. And uh, you're also warming up the electrolyte, which is going to enhance your kinetics for your electrocatalytic reaction. So that being said, uh, there are definitely significant challenges. Uh, so it would need to be very efficient and very cheap if you're going to make hydrogen at a cost which is competitive with fossil hydrogen. So you need something like maybe even 20% solar to hydrogen. Um, and you know, long durability is many years. However, at the end of my talk, I'm going to give you an outlook about how we might be able to speed that up. OK, so let's start with the dual working electrode. So I'm going to be talking about uh, PN junction photocathode. So effectively, we've got a P-type absorber. This is going to be either silicon, which we use kind of as a model, because we're going to be kind of developing new methods. We want to have make sure we understand what's going on. Copper oxide is one of our emerging materials that we're working on, and that's that's what we're going to be sort of testing. Sometimes we use a buffer layer or an N-type junction layer, and so for, for the cuprous oxide, we use gallium oxide. And this has a nice band alignment, and we can get relatively high photovoltages with that combination. We, it's not, that's just a very thin layer, and the copper oxide is not stable in water, unfortunately, so we use a protective layer, ALD, atomic layer deposited TiO2. And then finally, we put an electrocatalyst. So in a PV, for example, we would have some metallic contact and extract electricity. Now we're going to put an electrocatalyst and make hydrogen in this case. So we can use platinum or ruthenium oxide. Actually, ruthenium oxide is also an HER catalyst. It's uh, more resistant to poisoning. And we sort of experimented around with that to, to sort of extend the lifetime of our, our devices. OK, so, um, so we're usually doing just you know, focusing on one electrode at a time, three electrode measurements. And so this is the kind of the data that we get. We measuring with versus a reference electrode and then convert it to reversible hydrogen electrode. And we get a curve that looks like this, uh, current density milliamps per centimeter squared and voltage versus RHE. So what we look at or we consider is the onset potential, and that's a bit ambiguous how you define that, but let's just ignore that detail for now. But this essentially tells us the VOC of the material that we're fabricating minus the overpotential of the surface catalyst. So in the dark, right, a, our catalyst would sort of kick on here. And then uh, depending on the current density, you'll, you can sort of get your VOC. We're also considering the short circuit current, which we sort of approximate at zero volts versus RHE. So it's t hopefully we're at the plateau there, sort of the light limited current. And we're also concerned with the fill factor. Of course, we'd like to have our current be as square as possible, but we necessarily have some resistances, which makes this, pushes this curve in. And I'll talk a little bit more about that in the coming slides. So we do a, a stability measurement. And um, so let's say we're usually, we, we bias somewhere in the power conversion region, uh, 0.25 milli, milliamps, let's say, or sorry, milli, uh, volts per on the RHE scale. And then after some amount of time, it's going to be stable, hopefully for a long time, but eventually it's going to degrade. And then uh, we will then uh, measure a JV curve or a yeah, linear sweep voltammetry afterwards, and we see it looks like this. And we say, OK, clearly our material has degraded, but we don't know what has degraded, because there's different parts of this uh, electrode which can go wrong, let's say. So if I take this and now turn it on its side and superimpose this band alignment diagram, you effectively see that we've got a photovoltaic part, 
which is in series to this uh, electrochemical part. So effectively, this thin TiO2 layer, typically 50 or 100 nanometers, is like a wire that's conducting the electrons from the n-type uh, absorber to your catalyst. And so we could have some problem with the PV part. So with emerging materials, it's not so clear how stable these things are. So we might have some degradation of the photovoltaic output, for example, if you're pushing ions around inside your material. Uh, or we could have some degradation of the electrocatalyst. And so this is convoluted in, uh, in this curve. And so we, in order to deconvolute that, we need some more information. We need to know basically what the quasi-Fermi level of the electrons are in our P-type material. So we typically have one working electrode and we're attaching here to the back contact and we control the potential there. But we don't really know where this Fermi level is. Unless we're doing catalysis, then we know it's somewhere north of zero, volts versus RHE, but we don't know exactly. So um, yeah, so we, so, so we use the dual working electrode. There's some history on this. So basically what you can see, this is a, a TiO2 anode, which is coated with a thin metal film. So they've, they've I think, evaporated some three to five nanometers of gold which uh, is porous, so you can actually get light through and you can, you can actually do chemistry. Um, but it's pretty different than the system that you might actually use. And so the most recent incarnation of this was by Shannon, Shannon Betcher, uh, where he did a very nice study, again, looking at a, a co-catalyst on the TiO2 and sort of seeing the effect of charging and discharging this co-catalyst, again, coating the entire electrode with a thin, porous layer of gold. And so we wanted to sort of use this to study our systems, but not to so, so dramatically change it uh, from you know, how we might envision using it in a real device. And so we developed this sort of um, remote architecture. So this is the figure we saw before. So if we can sort of zoom in on the front contact, what we do is we lay down some, uh, we, we effectively uh, um, make some active area with epoxy, and then we sputter some gold on top such that it, part of the gold touches the TiO2 layer here. And then we come with a second layer of epoxy and totally bury that. And the distance here is about one millimeter. And so now this is just like our normal cell. Uh, so we've got the typical exposed area. We're shining light here. It's light's being mostly absorbed by the epoxy. We generate electron hole pairs here. The electrons travel in the TiO2 to the catalyst to do the reaction. Also, some of these electrons can diffuse and can then be, the, the potential can be t detected by this second working electrode. So in this way, we can carry out this, this reaction, and we can, what we do with this, this top, this front electrode is simply to measure the potential. So we're not controlling uh, current, we're not passing high current densities, right, because this is gonna be very resistive, but it's, it's good enough to sense the potential. And so we're gonna be scanning the potential up and down with the, on the backside, and simply measuring the open circuit potential of the surface, and then we can, uh, get the, the difference, we can essentially measure this uh, photo voltage while we're doing the water splitting experiments. And this is what it looks like in practice. Uh, so the silicon sort of buried underneath here and we've got some contact underneath here so we can make a contact to easily to the, the surface and to the back. Okay, so uh, what we're doing here is a step uh, potential um, photoelectrolysis, so we're controlling the back potential, this so-called V1, and we're starting very positive where we don't have any current. So the pink here is the, uh, is the current density, you see it starts at zero, and then at a certain current density we start to get, or a certain potential, we start to get uh, photo current, and then eventually it maxes out. And so we're just stepping the potential every, I think, 30 seconds typically, and uh, that's the back contact. And then if we now sensing the, the surface, what we see is that we, we get this pink curve here, and so before we get, the, uh, we get to the, ons or the onset of photocurrent, we basically just see the open circuit potential. So we're measuring here, so we're applying, let's say 0.9, and at the surface we're measuring 0.4. So we, we get this VOC, and, but we're not getting any current density. And you can see as soon as we get to a place where we cross zero volts versus RHE at the surface, that's where we get this big increase in the current density. So this is what the band alignment looks like under these conditions. So if we're biasing at 0.8, the photovoltage is not sufficient to, to do proton uh, reduction. And so, um, so the, the surface measured potential will be around here at 0.3, um, something like this. Uh, so right, so as we raise this up, then this is going to raise up. Eventually, we're going to get to the point where we have some hydrogen evolution. And so now here's bias at 0.2. Uh, which is about here, and now we can see that we're actually, the difference between the surface and the back is getting smaller and smaller, kind of similar to a power curve. Um, so this is, a, right, the power generation region, and then 
here's where technically we're at short circuit. Uh, so we're, we're where we have the same potential at the back and the front. And actually, surprisingly to us, this was is pretty far from zero volts versus RHE. So I, mean, I should say we didn't optimize this interface too much. We're more focusing on the optoelectronics in our in our in our work here and like optimizing you know these other materials. But essentially, we have a lot of losses. We need. Um, you know, so the, the surface potential is really minus 0.25 in order to drive only, let's say, 20 milliamps per centimeter squared. So a lot of, a lot of optimization that could be done there. Um, okay, and then finally, yeah, you can even bring it into reverse bias, and, but still you're sort of at the light limited or the, the current limited, uh, light limited here in this case. Okay, so, um, so here's uh, some real data. So here's the JV curve. Uh, this is our silicon uh, model with TiO2 and electrodeposited platinum. And if we then plot the current density versus the delta of the photovoltages, we get this nice curve here. And so this is effectively uh, a solar cell uh, curve. So we can use our water splitting data and, and extract a curve, which is exactly what we should get if we made a, a, a solar cell out of this material. And so one thing that we see is that we get a dramatic loss uh, of, of the fill factor, and that's because we are not extracting electricity at the contact, but we're doing a chemical reaction. We have uh, the, the, the TiO2 platinum junction, which may not be perfect. Also, we have the platinum ele electrolyte interface, again, um, which might have some losses, might get poisoned, for example. So what's nice about this, you can actually use this to see the, the overpotential of a surface catalyst. So molybdenum sulfide on the surface, in the literature, you get the number, it has a, 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 an, um, an overpotential of about 150 millivolts. And then we can see that. So when we, we measure our water splitting curve, we get this. But if we just plot it J versus the delta V between the front and the back, we get this nice, um, this is effectively what our VOC of our, of our solar cell underneath is. And so we get this nice offset of about 150 millivolts. So we can really see that. And so uh, to nicely sort of demonstrate when we see something that's degrading, so focus on the black curve here first. So we put um, molybdenum sulfide, again, not very optimized, and so we're just doing different sweeps, uh, uh, cyclic voltammetry, and we see that it's degrading with time. So on the 1st, the 8th, the 15th, and after one hour, uh, the, our electrode is degrading. We say, okay, well, what's going, what's going wrong? Okay, with silicon, it's pretty stable. We can have a guess. But if we look at the J delta V, they're all the same, even as this curve is degrading. So this tells us that, right, it's a problem of the catalyst. And in fact, if we take it out and we can uh, rinse the surface, we wash off some of this uh, degraded catalyst, we get some more light through. We have less parasitic absorption, so we get more current. And again, we recover our performance again, and now the, the J delta V looks pretty good. So right, so this sort of shows that this helps us to identify when there's a problem of the catalyst on the surface. And now we can look to see another case. So copper oxide, gallium oxide. So we have been looking at oxidized copper foils that we can, uh, at high temperature, make very high quality copper oxide. We can sputter gold on the backside for, as an ohmic contact. And then on the front side, we can do ALD deposition of gallium oxide and TiO2. So this makes the nice high voltage uh, contact. And then TiO2 is a passivation layer because unfortunately copper oxide is not stable in water. And now we're using sputtered platinum and, and more of it so that it's going to be more stable so we can have less worries that the, the catalyst is the problem. And we did a, the same sort of analysis and we see that, okay, before uh, we get this decent curve where we have an onset maybe at 0.9. And then uh, after some stability measurement, we see that we get a little, little bit later onset. And this is in fact also showing up in the the J uh, delta V curve. So this sort of, this implies, and the fill factor is the same, so the, the, the catalyst should be performing similarly. This seems to suggest that there's a degradation in the VOC uh, with this sort of uh, junction here. And we also investigated, we thought, okay, maybe this is due to the, electro, the, the water being in water solution, but actually we did this also in the solar state, uh, in the solid state, we met, measured it as a solar cell. It's a really terrible solar cell, it's very resistive. But still, uh, it's, we did see this uh, shift in the VOC even in the solid state. So that might be some, some issue to look at with this junction. Okay, um, so now I'm gonna switch to impedance, another way, another technique. And so the, the prior work on this was really pioneered by Viscarit and colleagues, and also later Tom Hammond, looking at how do we, so in looking at iron oxide in the beginning, just the, the prototypical example of a single material, one photoanode in this case, and then electrolyte contact. And, but there's still a, there's a lot of photophysical processes going on in even this very simple system. You've got generation, you've got trapping, you've got charge transfer. Um, and if you wanted to make a, an electronic circuit, uh, an equivalent circuit diagram, it gets very complicated. 
But actually, uh, when you do the experiment and run impedance, you usually see only one element or maybe two elements, and then you can collapse that very complex thing down into uh, just some simple RC element or this nested version here. Um, so that's just with one interface, but we're looking at in, you know, materials that have many different interfaces. So copper oxide, gallium oxide, here's another one, gallium oxide, TiO2, here, here. And so sometimes when we measure this, we started out just looking at uh, doing a resistance-based analysis. And you know, we sometimes see four semicircles, and, uh, and then, but uh, usually three, depending on the applied potential. But essentially, we wanted to be able to use impedance to study, to be, see, you know, can we identify each of these uh, processes by comparing it with other techniques and, uh, or, or, yeah, or other impedance uh, analysis methods? And then can we sort of identify the absorber? And then, so for example, we found that there's this surface um, um, resistance here. So this, the, you have a copper uh, cupric oxide interface, which causes some resistance. So then we could perhaps do some treatments and then look at this and characterize it by impedance. Okay, so then that was a resistance-based analysis and now we switch to sort of understanding the capacitance. And so we, we, uh, antimony selenide is another sort of low cost material that we look at in our group. And so we started studying that here um, with uh, you know, using this for our impedance studies. And so in this case, we dropped the, we dropped the, the light a little bit because uh, if we do one sun, then we just have way, a ton of bubbles. We get very noisy data. So you can do it, but you'd have to just do a lot of experiments. So to make it, uh, to make it a little bit easier, we just dropped the, the sun. Uh, and so we're getting on the order of about two milliamps per centimeter squared. And so to analyze, uh, analyze this, it's going to be useful to think about the pre-onset and the post-onset regions here. So we're going to use one circuit, equivalent circuit model here, and then another one in this where we have photocurrent generation. So this is just what it, it looks like. We're starting at very positive potentials where we don't have any current density, uh, and then we're scanning more and more negative. And so we've got this high frequency resistance, which is always there. We just, it's probably some uh, contact issue. We're just going to ignore it. And then we've got two other semicircles, and here's one, this, which is this middle frequency, which is we can see that the diameter of the semicircle is getting smaller and smaller as we go uh, more negative. And if we go farther, then we, then we finally, this shrinks down to almost nothing, and then we have the charge transfer resistance, this low frequency region here, which is now starting to shrink, and it gets to some minimum value. And now we move into uh, the region where we actually are generating hydrogen under, with this photocurrent. And again, we have this, this high frequency uh, circle, which is here. And now we have, uh, again, another mid frequency and a lower frequency, which are now growing. They're, you're getting more resistive as we go more and more uh, into depletion. And then if we go farther into depletion, it's growing and growing. So this behavior of increasing resistance is consistent with a, it's as a recombination resistance. And so that we are increasing the resistance for recombination, therefore we get more current. Okay, so these are the resistances. It's a lot, but I'll walk you through it. So again, let's just draw this line. So before the, the, the um, uh, in the pre and post uh, region. So here's the high frequency resistance, roughly the same. We're gonna ignore that. So we're gonna use this just simple uh, series, uh, you know, un um, of the RC elements for the TiO2 and the charge transfer. I'll tell you how we, uh, how we identified that on the following slide, but essentially, at, at positive potential, we have very high resistance, both for the, the electron transfer and also in our TiO2. And so as we go in more, we're, we're basically under, uh, as we go more and more into negative, we start to do more and more band bending. The TiO2 uh, formula uh, fla is, is starting like this and it starts to flatten out. And so the, the, the resistance for getting the charges out of the TiO2 drops down and then stabilizes. And then once it gets low enough, now we can do charge transfer. And that's where the current, the photocurrent really kicks in. And then here on this other side, we have um, now the recombination resistances, and we've used this sort of nested um, system here, but it's a bit, we're still trying to figure out exactly what these capacitances are. We have one that we know about, but then there's one that we don't know about. So if we look at the capacitances, here we have, again, in the pre-onset region, uh, uh, this blue one, which we say is TiO2. So what we can do is just use this capacitance to make a Machaki plot, and then we can get the expected um, doping density of the TiO2. It's actually pretty high, and that's, but that's typical of this atomic layer deposited TiO2. And the flat band potential is a bit shifted because actually we're, we're shining light, and so uh, even though we're applying this at the back, then at the surface potential we have another potential. So this is actually consistent with TiO2, and we can identify this 
um, this TiO2 uh, capacitance here. This, which we uh, attribute to the charge transfer resistance, we can also get similar time constants as with, the, uh, as with transient photo, uh, photo electrochemistry. And so then that, in its low frequency, it's no surprise, that's the charge transfer. And then with this other one, this green one, then this is, uh, gives us an acceptor concentration, which is, which is similar to what we see in the literature. And we can identify that as the antimony selenide. This other capacitance we're trying to figure out, we think it's somehow associated with the, um, the, the defect band. It seems not to be too uh, influential on the performance. So then we can identify, essentially, we know which semicircle we're looking for to look at the different materials. And so uh, we then expanded that and tested it on silicon as well as cuprous oxide. And we could then, uh, yeah, we, could, we saw the same uh, basically trend of behaviors with it in these overlayers. And then we could also we could identify this cuprous oxide and the silicon. And so this leads us to get, this gives us the, uh, to this proposed equivalent, equivalent circuit where, you know, where you can excite charges across the band gap, you know, and at early potentials, you know, these resistances are high, the charge transfer in the TiO2, and these recombination resistances are low, and so we just essentially recombine all the charge. And then as we go more and more, if, as we lift the, the potential here, and we get more and more band bending, we essentially make these resistances very large, and then these resistances are very small, and so then we can finally get the, char the charge out into the uh, electrode here. And so we then uh, were able to apply this to, uh, I guess I'm missing that slide, anyway. Uh, but yeah, we applied this to other um, uh, materials and we could show that it is, uh, oh wait, no, no, that's sorry, I'm, I'm getting ahead of myself. <laughs> okay, so now in the final few minutes, I just want to talk about one um, experimental uh, study that we're very interested in. So we were interested in using dipole layers to, to improve the photovoltage of water splitting systems. And then there are some examples in the literature, but they're usually not very stable. And so we thought, okay, we'll try to stabilize these with overlayers, but then you're really back into the realm of buried junctions and just like solid state photovoltaics. But we thought, okay, well, the, in water splitting systems, we're often using TiO2 as the overlayer to, to interface with water, to put a catalyst over here, do hydrogen evolution. So essentially, we just need to put a, a dipole layer here at this interface, and we can take whatever P-type material that we want and, uh, and ideally shift the bands with respect to TiO2 and therefore maximize the potential. And so that's what we did. And so we started with uh, silicon as, as some easily studi uh, studiable model. And we wanted to make this as uh, general as possible. So we, we use an anchoring layer of aluminum oxide deposited by, uh, TI, uh, by ALD. And then we spin coat on a, a solution of phosphonic acid, H3PO3. And we can tune the thickness here. And basically what this does is shift the bands down. And you see now we have a better conduction band alignment with TiO2. And when you uh, align the Fermi levels, then you make this result in a larger band bending, and therefore you get a larger um, photo potential uh, when you shine light. And so here's what the stack looks like, and then we made both water splitting cells and uh, PV. If we just finish it off with AZO and uh, thank you, AZO and the nickel grid. And basically what we see is that, so TiO2, silicon TiO2 is, is not a great heterojunction, and, and that's in fact what we see, it's not a great voltage. But when we put a dipole layer here, this insulating organic or kind of inorganic molecule, um, uh, at this interface we get this nice improvement in the, in the, in the potential, a couple hundred millivolts, and it's stable when we do these sort of high intent or long duration uh, PV uh, stability measurements. And we can tune it, so if we, if we tune the thickness of the, the phosphonic acid layer, which we can do by tuning this uh, concentration of the precursor solution of spin coating, then we can nicely shift the onset potential to more and more, to earlier and earlier. But then it's, it sort of maxes out. If we go too thick, then we start to see a drop again in the, in the thermodynamic energy conversion efficiency. And that's just because we have a too thick of an insulator and it's, uh, we're losing that. So we have our, our, um, our computation colleagues tried to see if they could also observe this effect. So we have a, an OH uh, or uh, hydroxyl terminated TiO2 surface. And again, here the TiO2 is just as a model oxide, it's not the overlayer. But just looking at the band positions and now replacing that with phosphonic acids and then go, even going up to multi-layers thin and, and thicker multi-layers. And in fact, what you see is that uh, the, the band shift down just as like we see in the experiment, even if we just have these thin and thick layers on top, we get an extra shift in the potential, which is very non-intuitive for us. 
And actually the potential drop is happening really here at the interface, so it's not like there's an electric field that's increasing here, it's really happening here. So this extra layer somehow modifying this. Um, we also see that experimentally in the, um, uh, in the phosphor signal of the XPS. It's nice and sharp and not spread out as if, the, if there would be uh, an electric field. Okay, in my final minute, I just wanted to, um, okay, I just put, say this was uh, reproducible on other materials, although the, the effect was less uh, dramatic because you, if you have some amount of Fermi level pinning, then you're not gonna get this extra bend bending and you don't get as much voltage. So you have to fix these interface states uh, if you wanna get the maximum photovoltage with this approach. Okay, so very quickly in my final minute, um, so I've talked about the electrode approach, but there's also this powder type approach where you can essentially get rid of all the wires and you just have a powder in, in water with different co-catalysts and then you're generating hydrogen and oxygen here. This can be pretty cheap because you don't have membranes or wires, and, um, but the challenge, which I think everyone realizes, is that you're making a mixture of hydrogen and oxygen. And this is, a, everyone, everyone used to think this is a deal breaker. But uh, again, recently there was some nice work by Doman where they showed very large scale photocatalytic water splitting and, uh, with, uh, and then separating the gas, you know, taking this gas mixture and separating it elsewhere. And uh, they did explosion tests and it was really undramatic. And so I was like, wow, okay, that's actually might work. So, um, so I guess what we think is that, you know, we, 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 we can use these thin film approaches and do, you know, all sorts of characterization techniques, also advanced characterization, impedance. And then ideally we can then trans, uh, translate this to photocatalytic systems where we can um, then hopefully have some very cheap uh, hydrogen in the future. Okay, good, my time is up, so that leaves me to thank my group and these people for funding and finally you for your attention. Thanks David for an excellent talk, so questions from the audience.